Lord bless everyone. And I wish today to talk about one of the key factors that we see the glory of God the most, and that was in the humbleness of Jesus. When Jesus humbled himself, the glory of God was seen. It was seen the most. For example, in Jesus' birth and becoming a man. We read in Luke chapter 2, verse 7 to 19. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Let's just read till verse 16. Verse 7 to 16. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped them in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him, for them in, an, in the inn. There was no room for Jesus in an inn. Jesus was in a manger. Manger at that time were made of stone. They were not made of wood. You won't see the wooden mangers that that you will see in Christmas time. No, they were made of stone at that time. Um, let's continue verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord shone before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were so afraid, they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to you all, to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. I want you to understand this. Jesus is born not in an inn, not in a palace, but he was born In a barn, and in, in those times, those barns would have been most likely inside a cave. And he was put on a manger. Mangers were made of stone. A feeding trough. Jesus laid. Wrapped in swa- swaddling clothing. Oh, Jesus. Jesus had a humble beginning. He humbled himself when he became a man. But guess what? In his humbleness, there we see the glory of God. What happened? The glory of God shone upon the shepherds and told them, the angel told them, the Savior is born, the Lord is born. You will find him here. You will find him in a manger. You will find him not in a palace, but in the least likely place that you imagine. Oh, the humbleness of Jesus. In the humbleness of Jesus, one can see the glory of God. And and we're going to continue looking at the glory of God in other places in scriptures. Like, for example, in Jesus' baptism, Jesus was baptized. He didn't have to be baptized. He wasn't a sinner. 
baptism was done for repentance of sin. But yet he humbled himself in that in, in being baptized. Read in Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. You are sinless. You are faultless. There's there's nothing wrong with you. Well, Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him, and when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to them, to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is baptized, and what happens? What happens? The glory of God happens. We hear the voice of the Father, but before that we hear, we see the, 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 the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And we hear the voice of the Father saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. I want to manifest my Son to you. And if you read in Mark's Gospel, let's go to Mark's Gospel. Mark 1. What do, do, what do we see in Jesus' baptism? In Mark's gospel, we, we in verse eleven, chapter one, it says, "Then a voice came to from heaven, saying, You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased.' Not only did Jesus, the God, the God, the Father, spoke to Jesus in front of John the Baptist and said, "He is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased." Well, also we see the Father speaking to Jesus and saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we see also the glory of God in Jesus' baptism. Oh, the glory of God in Jesus' humbleness. Jesus humbles himself. We see the glory of God manifested to us. Oh, sometimes we have to humble ourselves. Oh, all the prideness that we have at times. Not to humble ourselves, but what we see Jesus as our example of humbleness, of love divine. I think I wrote a poem on the humbleness of God. I'm going to read it next, right after we, we play this song. Come and listen in to a radio station where the mighty host of heaven sing. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. If you want to hear the songs of Zion coming from a land of endless spring, get in touch with God. Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. And listen to the music in the air. Turn your radio on. Listen in to the glory land chorus. Listen to the glad hosannas roll. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Get a little taste of joy so waiting. Get a little heaven in your soul. Get in touch with God. Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. And listen to the music in the air. Turn your radio on. Turn the lights down low and listen to the master's radio. 
Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on. Hallelujah. Let's get in touch with God. I wrote a poem last um, December. Um, it's called Humbleness of Love Divine. And it reads like this. Humbleness of love divine was what brought the Lord above to a manger here below. Humbleness of God to you and me. Humbleness of love divine that a virgin once bared and holding on our arms a gift for you and me. Though the creator of all, yet so small to hold in one's arms and even smaller to hold in one's heart. Humbleness of one who is God and man. Before the creation of all, humbleness of love divine thought to become so small for you and me. So sing to the humbleness of love divine, love that became clay of dirt for you and me. Humbleness of love divine, no other can be so sweet to lost sinners here below, to give such a gift for you and me. Such a gift that burst of love that never ends, which pours like rain and snow on Christmas Day. All oh, humbleness of love divine. All oh, there is a divineness in, in the humbleness of God. Oh, he loved us so much. He loved us so much. And, and we even see Jesus humbling himself in fasting for 40 days. And there we also see the glory of God is going to be right after Jesus fast. We see in Mark 1 verse 12 to 13, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan and was with the wild beast. And the angels ministered to him. When did the angels minister to him? They ministered to him right after his fasting. Oh, brothers and sisters, Jesus fasted and the glory of God came afterwards. I want you to understand that. Jesus humbled himself again. And then again, we see the glory of God. Matthew 4, 11. Then the devil left them after his fasting. And after the temptation, the devil left them. And behold, that's Matthew 4, 11. And behold, the angels came and ministered to him. They ministered to him after the temptation. The glory of God shone again upon Jesus when Jesus humbled himself. Oh, brothers and sisters. Jesus is set as our example, but he's also set as our Lord and Savior and God. I want to uh, let you know that Jesus is also our example. We're told in Ephesians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's Philippians 2 5, and which we're going to get back there in, in a few. We also see... In the crucifixion, Jesus submitting and accepting the, the, the crucifixion. Before the crucifixion, Jesus had to accept it. In Jesus' acceptance of the crucifixion, we see God glorified. Read in John 12, verse 27 to 30. Jesus said, My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice is, did not come because of me, but for your sake. Again, the Father glorifies Jesus when Jesus humbles himself and accepts the crucifixion. Luke 22, verse 39 to 43 says, 
coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. And as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Just understand this. When did the angel appear? When he accepted the crucifixion. Oh, Jesus has struggles. You're not the only one with struggles. Jesus knew struggles. Imagine Jesus' holy, sinless body was about to receive our sins upon him. Oh, brothers and sisters, who wouldn't want to back away from this? Knowing what he was going to go through. But he did not. He accepted it. He humbled himself even to the point of the cross as we will see. Let's let's play the let's play this hymn. Um, Come thou fountain of every blessing. How we are prone to leave the God we love so much at times. 
for just any little thing, any little sin, we're prone to leave him at times. Oh, brothers and sisters, let's draw near to him because he will draw near to us. Oh, brothers and sisters, let's not leave this God. Let's not forsake him, for he does not forsake us. He does not leave us. Let's continue in our walk with God. If anything, let's make our walk with God more stronger. We have an enemy that wants to destroy us. He's a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And and he's just waiting for you to leave that walk. Because as soon as you leave it, he's going to attack you. And you won't get back up on your feet. We're living in days that if a person leaves this walk, it's not guaranteed they're going to go back. Oh, brother and sister, I'll come back. I'll come back before I die. Well, don't you think the devil knows that? (laughs) Don't you think the enemy is surrounding you and telling you, well, you could, you could, you could, you could, you could accept Christ again. You could receive him again in your life when, when you're old or, 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 or when you're in the hospital bed. There'll be enough time. There'll be enough time. I want to tell you, there's not enough time. If you have left the walk of God, I don't know why I'm saying this. I don't know who's hearing this. If you left the walk of God, and you think that you're going to come back when you're old and gray. Or when you're in a hospital bed. Many times you won't get that chance because it's pre-planned. Don't think you have that chance because you could die tonight. You could die this very minute. Death is only a step away. You don't know what could happen to you when you leave the house. As a matter of fact, you don't know what can happen to you when you're in the kitchen, the dining room, the room, or in the bathroom. How many deaths have now occurred in the same house? Don't pre-think that, oh, I'm, I'm going to be safe. No, brother and sister. You're not going to be safe. If you're thinking of leaving his walk, or if you have not, if you left his walk, or if you don't know him. They're not going to be saved. You need, you, you need to get saved. You need to get back in the walk of God. Or you need to repent. I don't know who I'm speaking to. But I must be speaking to somebody. Before I continue. At Jesus' crucifixion. We see the glory of God. At the crucifixion. In Jesus humbling himself. Look at what happened at Jesus' crucifixion. First, let's read Matthew 27, verse 45 to 54. Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama samatani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said this man is calling for Elijah immediately one of them ran and took a sponge filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink the rest said let him alone let us see if Elijah will come to save him and Jesus cried out Again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection They went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the Satuitan and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly and saying, 
truly this was the Son of God. Notice all these events that happened where Jesus was willing to be crucified, when Jesus was crucified. All the, the, the grave uh, uh, people came out from the dead and came to their loved ones. The tombs were open. And, and not to finish that, the veil of the temple was sliced in half. And even the pagans, the, the Setuitan, the Romans, soldiers, they were made to confess, this is the Son of God. Well, let's, let's go to Philippians 2, verse 5 and 11 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, in the morphe of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, but taking the form, the morphe, the nature of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, brothers and sisters, the glory of God appeared manifestly when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus humbled himself, the glory of God. Jesus humbled himself, the glory of God. Jesus humbled himself, the glory of God. I want you to understand that every time Jesus humbled himself, the glory of God is seen, is manifested for you and me. And it's also an example for you and me. We need to humble ourselves more. Because if you don't humble yourself, God's going to humble you. And sometimes he doesn't do it in a very nice way. He disciplines the children he loves. Oh, I won't do, I, I won't go to this place to preach to this person. Oh, Lord, what do you think I am? To go to this place To preach to this person If you're not going to do it In a good way He might get you to do it In the wrong way I remember one day <clears throat> I was walking down <clears throat> The street And the Lord told me Preach to these drug dealers And I was Like a little hesitant and I just walked by them and kept on walking. And one of them yelled at me. And said something. I don't remember exactly what he said. And I started arguing with the man. And then I started preaching a sermon to them. To the group of drug dealers. And it looked like they was going to beat the living daylights out of me. But one of them. Said. The things that you're saying preacher make sense. I want you to understand something. When God wants you to humble yourself. It's for a reason. God wanted to save a toll in that drug corner. If I wouldn't have preached to them, that soul wouldn't come. But I want you all to understand something here. I wasn't going to do it. Not because I don't want to listen to God. It's because I didn't want to go through that situation. I did not want to humble myself. I wanted to be a Pharisee at that point, And I just wanted to walk by them and not care. But God said, you're going you're gonna to preach to them. And I said to God, do I have to? And 
God permitted one of them to curse at me or say something to me that provoked me to go up to them and start preaching. There's some occasions where God has told me, stand on top of that bench and preach my word. And I'm like, Lord God, do I have to? And then I hear the word saying, yes, you have to. And I start preaching. And then I hear some drug dealers mocking me. And then I see some people looking at me and, 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 and just listening to what I have to say. And then one of them came to me, a drug dealer came to me and he said, keep it up. I really need to hear this. I want you to understand something. When God humbles you and he puts you in a situation that you don't want to be in, is because someone needs to hear it. Someone needs to see it. Someone needs to be impacted by the word of God. And if you're not going to do it in a nice way, God is going to make you do it in the wrong way, but he's going to make you do it. He's going to take you to places where you don't want to be in. And he's going to bring you out. Oh, does it, does it mean that at my testimony, sometimes your testimony might be affected. But guess what? God wants your humbleness. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Let's play a hymn. Let's play. Let's play. Jesus saves.
we could also see the glory of God being manifested hum- in humbleness in the life of Joseph. I want you to understand something. What happened when Joseph was humbled and sold as a slave? He prospered in the house of Potiphar. Oh, what happened when Joseph was thrown into prison and humbled there in chains? He prospered in the prison because everything he did prospered. And the ultimate result of all the suffering this man was humbled in was so God could lift him up second to Pharaoh. Oh, God has to humble us to do something with us. God did it with David. God did it with Moses. God had David running from Saul for years, escaping, going even to pagan lands to be able to survive. He had to humble himself in many occasions to the king, being able to kill him. No, he humbled himself. And it did no harm to him. And he even bowed down to him. (laughs) David had to be humbled before he could become king. Moses, with all his education and wisdom, he received education from Egypt. He, He went to the best schools. Age 40... He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to deliver Israel, and they're going to recognize me. <clears throat> so he killed an Egyptian that was hurting a Hebrew. Then what happened? What, what happened? He thought that they was going to recognize, oh, this is the one. This is the one that's going to save Israel. But Israel did not recognize them such. He had to flee Egypt because they said, Who made you prince over us? Then 40 years later, dealing with sheep and goats and as a shepherd, brothers and sisters, when he probably did not, wasn't able to speak, 40 years in the desert with sheep and with untrained, uncivilized shepherds. When he was in his mind, was not prepared, he was very humbled. God told him, it's time for you to go to Egypt and deliver my people. And Moses said, I can't do it. I can't speak. You're not calling me when I was 40. When I was in my prime, you're calling me when I'm 80 and I'm stuttering every single step of the way. Oh, look at the way God needs to humble us to start using us, to start showing us his glory. God has to humble us. God has to put us in a situation where we have no way out except to look up. So the glory will be for God and not for us. So the glory could not be shared, but could only people could say, God did it. Oh, that wasn't that wasn't him. That had to be God. I saw his glory. Let's let's play a hymn. Let's play There is a Fountain.
In Luke 15, we have the story of the prodigal son. And that is also a story of God having to humble someone. Because he wanted his inheritance. He thought he could deal with his inheritance. Um, this is found in Luke 15, verse 11 to 32. Um, maybe... Maybe in my next program, I'm going to preach about the prodigal son. I think that will be a nice sermon to preach about. Uh, <clears throat> he wanted his inheritance at this point. Uh, I want to prepare a sermon on that. But one thing is what I want you to understand. He had to lose his inheritance. He had to see himself poor, begging for a job, wanting to eat what the pigs ate but none would have given it to him. He had to see himself in a condition of humbleness before he could come to God. Symbolism of before he could come to God. <clears throat> before he could come to his father, he had to see himself humbled. And the same thing, I want to tell you something. Sometimes before you... Come to Jesus all the time before you come to Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You have to recognize who you are. Peter recognized and was humbled and said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Isaiah said, I'm going to die because I've seen God and I have an unclean mouth. Humbleness. Job said in Job, I believe it's Job 39, he said, Behold, I'm vile. I put my hands on my mouth. God has to humble you and, rec- and make you recognize how sinful you are and how holy he is before you could come to him in repentance and salvation. Let's pray and then we're going to leave for now. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless everyone that heard this program today. Bless them spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. Lord God, bless them in every single way, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. May the words that were preached may be put in their hearts and may they be able to live it in their lives. Amen. I want to tell you something. If if you feel this program is a blessing to you and you want this program to continue, um, with God's help, may it continue. Um, and if if God touches you, only if God touches your heart, if you want to give to this to this program, so it it can also bless other people. Um, feel free and give to this program. Um, my email is rev. Kakalides at gmail.com um, you could give through PayPal and if or you could just 
send me an email. If not, send me an email and tell me, yeah, give me an address so I can send you money. And I'll give you an address and you could give an offering if you desire. Um, see you in our next program of Mr. Kakalides and the Bible Podcast. And keep this program and keep me in your prayers. Please keep me in your prayers. I, I need all the prayers I, I could get, you know? Because the enemy wants to take me down because he knows this program is going to save many souls. And he knows that this program is going to edify many souls. So, so the enemy is attacking here and there. But guess what? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And he, and the same one that's in me, if you're a believer in Jesus, he's in you too. And you're going to overcome as well. The Lord bless you, love you, and I'll see you next program with Mr. Kakalides and the Bible Podcast. So long.